The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So we're going to continue looking at the Prokofiev Vision Fugitive. And we have numbers 14, 15, and 16 today. And I think, guys, that probably what we should do is do them in that order, uh, since we, we've sort of got this little set. Um, and we can even discuss, arguably, if there are things that are part of each one. Um, so, Mason, are you first? How would you like to begin your presentation? I'll hear the piece first. I'm sorry? Can we all hear the piece first? Sure. What, what, what measure are we talking about? Seven, measure seven, sorry. Okay. Um, I get you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and so it, it's interesting. The, um, the theme gets introduced in the right hand, and then it shows up in the left hand, but transposed the whole step. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the thirds move up there, too. And so after that, we have a repeat of the first theme, uh, but an octave down. And instead of the original accompaniment, we have these third, the third motive, but moving in whole steps now, more or less. We can actually moving modally. Um, and then we have this really interesting run in the right hand, which is just all thirds um, in some kind of C-ish uh, scale. And then there's a bit of a transitional, another two measures of transition, I think. Uh, which has, if you play it on piano, it's a C major transposed with chromatic neighbors in the left hand, and that kind of has a, a rhythmic pattern there. And after that, we have the B section, which is significantly different. But it, it's interesting because it appears pretty similar on the page, but when they play it, um, it has a much gentler, um, quieter kind of feel to it. Um, and this section is a lot of, has a lot of um, fixation on chromatic neighbor notes. So you have this pattern of you know, uh, a third down and then a half step up, which appears over and over again. Um, and you have the portal complement in the left hand. Um, the phrase structure here is, I think, a lot clearer than in the first part. It breaks down into roughly two groups. Um, it's kind of hard to hear, but it's kind of an interesting consequent phrase. The, um, the first is three and a half measures, starting from measure, at the end of measure 15, um, and the three measures after that. That repeats, but higher in the next um, mm -hmm. three measures. And 
and then we have another run going down this line. Um, and then the, the whole idea kind of repeats again. So this B section repeats but an octave up. And with configuration, addition, that kind of just outlines um, a C ish kind of chord. I had a hard time with this section trying to figure out what was going on. But you go on here for another six measures. Um, there is an identical run except for the accompaniment on the right hand, and then you wind it back at a repeat of the A. Um, except the A section is fairly compressed this time. Um, you don't get the same. The, the chromatic material from the first A section is completely gone, and it gets replaced with. Um, actually, it doesn't, it doesn't get replaced with anything. It gets taken out, and then you get the repeat of the theme, knock it down, and then some coda material. And then it kind of ends in a peculiar note. It's like giant cluster of Swartzando chords. Um, but yeah. I guess does anything strike you guys about this piece? Like what are your favorite ones? Aspects? Does it sound angry or like <laughs> how do you, does it sound happy? Or or is it well, and you might, Mason, just ask, what does what what is the tempo marking? Ferocious. Yeah, which means? Ferocious. Yeah, ferocious. This is not a tempo marking you see very often. Sounds like a statement. It sounds like everything in the left hand is like a big downbeat. Like, I feel like it's just like a crunching. It's like a continuous, like, stomping, like, throughout the piece that is yeah, a very like tense feeling. Yeah. Kind of a military march yeah. <laughs> yep. What else about that? I even think it's an effect that is almost sort of the piano equivalent of like snare drum music. You know, it's this very rattly, uh, extraordinarily percussive thing, and right, and that's one of the big deals in piano music of the 20th century is really exploiting the percussive elements of the instrument. And boy, does this piece do in a way um, that you know, no doubt, would have shocked Brahms, uh, the composers of the generation before. Uh, you know, while certainly they could exploit it uh, for percussive effects, it's a very different thing. So, in fact, I think some of these clusters are more important, perhaps, not for the actual notes they contain, but for the amount of noise they make. Yeah. Um, it, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it, this sounds a lot like Suggest John Diabolique by Bakhmutovia, which is very similar in terms of its characteristics. Right. How many people know the, the piece? Uh, suggestion diabolic, diabolical suggestions. Um, absolutely, it is arguably the only piece by Prokofiev that is sort of more expressionist in its gestures than this one. So yeah, and, and they're written close to the same time and are part of that same Prokofiev at his, his most intense. Yeah, good things to point out. So the form of the piece you're saying is really just an ABA, essentially. Yeah, on a, and each section has a bit of form to, in, in and of itself. So right. Of right. I'm sort of interested in how you get from one of those sections to another. Could you talk a little bit about that, or do, do sort of people notice how that works? It always seems to transition with these 16th note runs in the right hand. Right. Do any of those 16th run note runs work exactly like the first one, though? No, this is kind of an interesting one. I don't think any of the shows up quite like this. 
Yeah, so let's look at measure 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Is that where the run happens? It's marked con brio. Do all of our additions have the con brio marking? What's going on there, at least in terms of the right hand? <laughs> it's incredibly Brahmsian if you play it in slow motion. Why is it incredibly Brahmsian? Absolutely. If it was Brahms, right, they'd go the other direction. The, the thirds are always descending. But here, absolutely. So notice that they actually give us a series. Each of these 6-8 measures gives us, if we look at those 16th notes, we have four note groupings that are really just seventh chords, right? Everybody notice how that's working? Uh, and it has an interesting effect. There's almost a sort of hemiolia effect going on in the measure because of the way that works out. Now, so I'm wondering, is there anywhere else in the piece that we get that strong a sense of these seventh chords? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, the, the big send up of the sort of more lyrical tune. Yeah, I, I'm willing to go with that. Does anyone see maybe any other connections to that? I'm sort of imagining towards the end of the piece. Yeah, those uh, clusters of chords. Right. Right, does everybody see that, where it does this thing? Right. 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 Am I going too far in saying that I hear a sort of reminiscence of that? Well, when we listen to it later, let, let's sort of think about that a little bit. Other things that people sort of find intriguing. Yeah? I think in terms of the, the energy that you feel when you listen to it, the sense of propulsion is partly the, the hemiola we're talking about, but also the way some of the notes are beamed and the phrasing, how it, um, if you, it, at the, on the one hand, it has this very rhythmic sense. If you really feel that you're in 6 8, on the other hand, it's um, pulling at that with the melody, and there are two forces at play sort of making the, the piece go forward. Right. I think, this, I think absolutely that's true. Other things that you sort of notice or find curious or interesting. Well, you know, that takes us to the sort of standard question. What key is this in? I said D. -ish. Yeah, I, I can get D ish. There's a lot of C sharps. Yep. D ish is certainly a reasonable choice. Anyone else pick another choice? What about the B section? B section seems kind of E minor-ish at first. Right. What's the accompaniment, though, of the B section? C. It's pretty C-ish, right? Right. But I think Nick is saying, but I'm hearing melodically the notes C, A flat, and B. Everything keeps circling around that B, and the B is kind of working as the dominant in E, right? So again, that sort of bitonal pull 
that we were looking at the pieces for last time uh, is an important component here. Now, this B section, uh, so the strategy is you have this pretty straightforward accompanimental figure, at least something that's perfectly clear as an accompanimental figure, right? And then we do one, two, three, four measures of the tune above that. And then it sort of goes in a slightly different direction, becomes ornate, uh, the 16th note figuration. And then we sort of do it again, right? Isn't that how it works? And this time with the figuration involved and so forth. Now, is there anything, what would you say about the transition back to A? There's barely any transition that just happens. Uh, you, there's barely any transition at all, right? And it's sort of interesting, because if we go back to our, our sort of seventh chords in measure 13, that's clearly a bridge passage, right? Everything about that says bridge passage. And that's something to keep in mind. I mean, when you're at the BSO and you're listening to one of the standard concertos in the repertoire, where, how do you know you're in the bridge passage of a concerto? Soloists shed off a lot. Uh, absolutely. That's where all the fancy, flashy, virtuosic stuff is. And this looks exactly that, that kind of thing, right? Absolutely. You, because you can just develop all of this figuration because you're probably just doing a sequence anyway. And so it's all going to work out really pretty well. Absolutely. I think one of the things here that's really interesting is the way that the idea of a bridge back to the to the A theme is simply thrown away, right? We don't need that. It's exactly the kinds of things that we've been trying not to do in our sonata form movements, right? So uh, absolutely, uh, something, something very new and part of this sort of 20th century aesthetic. Uh, other things that you notice about the piece or want to say about the piece, Mason? Or anybody else? Rich, did you have something or? Nope. <laughs> I think nope. The, um, the technique that he does with the, like, in bar six with the great note groups of, yep. uh, of four notes going up is, is sort of characteristic of these like this. He does the same thing in the um, suggestion diabolique, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it's just, I think it's a really good example of something where, like, the pitches or the tonality it doesn't really matter, I think, in this case. It's just like, that's done purely for like gestural effect. Sure. Um, and it gives us sort of one of the, another one of those sort of almost percussion-y kinds yeah, of effects. <laughs> yep. Um, now I would argue a little bit. I think that in fact he's chosen the notes well, yeah. right? Um, If you look at the first four measures, and I think this is worth interesting talking about in terms of an early modernist piece, are there some distinctly wrong notes present? G sharp. The G sharp. Does everybody hear the G sharp as a wrong note? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Abs exactly, and syncopated, and everything about that is sort of about saying, this is a wrong note. Now look at the other black note, the C sharp. Is it accented in the same way? No, yeah, it does have a downbeat, but it seems to be sort of part of the actual collection of notes, again suggesting, well, maybe we are sort of D, right? And this is the raised leading tone, but the G sharp, no, the G sharp traditionally will, we might think, well, part of a secondary dominant complex. It's the seven of A. Does the G sharp go up to A? Absolutely not, right? In fact, you know, the sore thumb is being made sore by, by repetition. Um, so absolutely, I think those are, those are things to keep in mind. Other things to point out. 
sort of the nice effect in the B section of dividing the accompaniment figure between the hands. Um, this is a thing that is often credited as being the invention of Liszt, and you see people talk about it as the three-hand technique. Um, anyone who's ever played Bach knows that you have to break up figuration between the hands. But anyway, Liszt is credited with this. Shall we listen to it again? I think. Certainly ferocious. Any questions or sort of comments or final things to think about it? Is it intriguing or is it just ugly? It is neat. And in fact, the middle section uh, isn't so ferocious. It's quite beautiful. Yeah. It yeah. Has a, a yeah. Absolutely. Let us move on, I think, to the next one. But we'll sort of keep that in mind because we may want to talk at the very end about how do these work together. Uh, is this one yours, Steve? No. Uh, Rajiv's. OK. Shall we play it, too? Yeah. So yes, well, I'll start by saying that the, the tempo marking means anxious, so I think it's pretty appropriate. Um, and <clears throat> so I guess how it breaks down, um, I thought the first uh, two and a half measures were um, just like an introduction, um, sort of like Mason's, like it just <clears throat> established like the ostinato on the bass. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's an A section, and then B, and then <clears throat> there's an A prime. Uh, and then a B prime, and then there's like an A double prime, I guess. Um, and then there's like a coda at the end of the closing material. Um, and so, um, I guess starting with the introduction, um, the ostinato is kind of, <coughs> it's just like this pulsing in the bass, and um, it, it's basically just a C minor, or I heard it as a C minor chord, I guess, with just the, it repeats. The, or C sharp minor, sorry. It repeats the C sharp three times. Mm -hmm. the um, and then just and that just keeps going for a really long time. Um, and so that keeps going through the A section. And the A section is this. Um, so the right hand plays a bunch of triads, and they start ascending chromatically. Um, and they they ascend chromatically on the offbeats. Um, and then once it gets into the second measure of the A section. Um, the triads kind of like it, the triads kind of split up into the top two notes and the bottom note, mm -hmm. and they ascend like alternatingly on um, on each beat of the measure. So one of them will ascend. Well, we'll play two eighth notes and then a quarter, and the other will play a quarter and two eighth notes. Um, and then at the end of the A section, um, it cadences on a um, C major chord, and then goes into the B section. Um, and the B section is pretty different. Like it, it stops playing the triads and just starts playing this descending kind of movement in the right hand. Um, and so I wasn't really, I wasn't really sure what to, what exactly to call the B section, um, because the the first two measures after the A section's over um, kind of seem a little bit like a bridge. Um, but the material from that kind of goes on to the next part, um, where the forte, I don't know if you all have the forte marking, uh, mm -hmm. and that, that kind of starts like a little bit of a new thing that repeats a little bit. And so uh, that's where um, the right hand plays a couple triads, and then it starts this repeating this figuration with the two sixteenth notes, and then the two eighth notes, and then the quarter note. Um, and then that, that keeps repeating with the two sixteenth notes, and then and the two eighth notes. And I thought this section was um, pretty clearly in B minor. Um, it seems to it seems to always each of the figurations seems to always end in B. Mm -hmm. um, and and then the asano in the bass is now playing uh, three Bs and a D. So um, and then it immediately just goes right back into um, the A section 
Um, but this time it's a little different. Um, in the first A section, the the bass kept playing the C sharp, the C sharp minor. Um, but this time it, it changes through the chromatic ascending scale in the right hand. Um, and this time instead of cadencing on a C major triad, um, it's an E minor triad. Um, and then it goes into the B section again. And the beginning, the first two measures are exactly the same, and then it starts going into a little different kind of iteration. Um, and this time, instead of repeating the, the two sixteenth notes and then the eighth notes, it, it does this uh, quarter note, two eighth notes, and then a quarter note, and then another eighth note um, configuration. Um, and that continues for a couple of measures. And then it goes into what I call the A double prime section. Um, and it's related to the A section, but the left hand is pretty different this time. So instead of doing, um, instead of doing the um, ostinato kind of thing, it's, this time it's also doing the same chromatic scale. Um, except this chromatic scale ascends every eighth note, not, not just in the offbeats. Um, and so this lasts for like five measures, and then and then it goes into the closing material. And I thought this is my favorite part. Like I thought it was really cool um, because it plays um, it plays that ostinato bass with the with in eighth notes. And then after one iteration of the eighth notes, then it starts playing it starts playing it in octave lower, but in quarter notes, so at half speed. Um, and then after one iteration of that, then it plays it in octave lower than that in half notes. Um, so that's at a quarter speed. And then after one iteration of that, it just stops. And I thought that's pretty cool. Um, and so I guess I thought, like the entire piece as a whole definitely sounds like the C, C sharp minor is established right at the beginning and at the end also. But it kind of travels to different places during, during the piece. Um, but I guess like it, it leaves you with that C sharp minor impression, I think. So I think it establishes, or it leaves you with more of a tonal impression than a lot of the other pieces. Well, I think there's a sense of it certainly ends where it begins. Do other people hear it pretty much as being in C sharp minor? Do we, do we like that? What about the bass ostinato? Right, C sharp, E for a while, then it right before what, what Rajiv is calling the B section, then it moves, the C moves down to C natural, but the E stays in place, right? Then we get that loud punctuation of B, 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 D, um, and then we get that, then we move up to C sharp again, right? And then that sort of interesting thing where we get the fifths in the bass, right? F sharp. F minor, E minor, right? Sits on E for a while, then down to D, uh, and then we do it again, back to C sharp, F sharp, so forth. So there's a sort of limited range of things it does. Um, for me, the curious thing is why are those descents sometimes chromatic? and sometimes not, right? Why does the E minor one go to D uh, major, um, so forth? So that's kind of an interesting thing. What about the, the thing you call the B section? And I'm perfectly content calling it that. What's that melodic idea like at B? How many notes are in play in that measure? And other people can answer that too. One, two, three. There's like seven, or I mean, if you count the top to this is the same. Don't count octaves. Don't count octaves. 20th century music, we never count octaves. It's like, I think there's like six or seven. That many? Oh, well, if you look at the downbeat, you get I'm a G. But really, the, the right hand is just E, D, B, and A, right? That's all that that melody is made of. And then we get the A duplicated and a C added. So there's only five notes in play. So uh, it's not a pentatonic scale in the general formation. We like it, but it is a five-note collection of pitches, absolutely. 
how does that compare to the music that comes before it? Is it more diatonic or less diatonic? Sorry, that was a leading question, wasn't it? Yes, it's, it's more diatonic. Let's just go with that. Um, and so it, it does have a lot of contrast. And I'm guessing that's the aspect of it that led you to identify it as B. Yeah, I get that. So when that material comes back, how is it different melodically than it was the first time? Well, it starts out, it starts out exactly the same, um, except it has, except the, uh, the bass line is playing a different harmony for, for me. Right, right. Um, but then once it like once it moves on, then it's really different. Like the first, the first time, it, it definitely seemed like it was in B minor to me. Um, but the second time, it's like all over the place. Although at the very beginning, it seems very E-like. Yeah, yeah. Well, to me, and I wonder if other people were hearing that too. So different harmonizations. It's interesting this time in that it does sort of. You know, we've got the G from the bass, so we've got G, A's present, B's, D is an F, and that really is a regular sort of pentatonic figuration. For it. so, it's sort of almost, you know, maybe sort of changes its character in a sort of interesting way. And you're right, it extends and it goes to a different place, right? And then we get that little bit of new material but always over the sort of ostinato, A double prime. Um, and I think that's an interesting moment, the A double prime, in that it's clearly A-like material, but it's sort of the only time in the piece where the ostinato goes away. And it's replaced by that chromatic ascending line. Um, do you remember another one of these where we had the repetition of an A section and the accompaniment was now a chromatic? Yeah. Well, yeah, what does that chromatic line do? Descends. Exactly, and this is the glory of a totally chromatic line, is it can go either way, um, absolutely. And then the really sort of this hammered, really violent ending, reasserting the C-sharp E thing. Comments and thoughts about this piece? I guess I, I like what he does with the melody on this piece. And I, a lot of the other pieces of what that just because he really plays with your perception of what's tonal and what's not tonal, and he uses yep. that contrast to like really make the piece interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. One thing I noticed that I, I don't know why, but it seems like he never has like six in the melody without like a third, or like he, it seems like he likes thirds a lot more than sixes. I don't know why. Oh, that's interesting. Like in all the pieces we looked at, like there's never a six without a third, but there's always a thirds everywhere. But I don't know if it's because they sound more crunchy or like. I don't, <laughs> I don't have an I don't have an idea about that. That's very interesting. It's a neat perception. Um, anybody have an answer for that? Yeah. Sort of an idea. Um, I think he just he seems really like more sort of close chord voicings a lot in general. Yeah. I think that might be kind of what it comes down to because it's less less sort of like sonorous and more. You get the nasty overtones this way yeah. rather than the pretty helpful overtones. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. One thing also that I think is a sort of nice detail, and the A prime thing when we get the chromatic ascending scale uh, towards the end of the piece, how, does everybody notice how that's marked dynamically? Right, so that the accompaniment is marked as louder than what we would think of as the principal material. That's a sort of interesting thing. So, Natasha, you've had nothing to say about the piece. Do you just hate it or you, do, do you have a visceral response of any kind to it maybe? But I think that that might have more to do with just, I don't know, it sounds slightly more tonal to me, and I'm a bit biased, I guess. That's, that's fine. That's fine. I love the way that it just becomes so bombastic at the end. And, uh, just uh, if, if you're going to make some sort of statement, you know, make it 
<laughs> yes, indeed, and I think it's fair to say it ends with a declarative statement. Uh, it, it, that's absolutely right. You're, I, I agree with you on that. Anyone else have any sort of take on this piece? Because we need to move on and look at the next one. Um, any connections to the piece before it? Yeah. Yeah. Could be. Could be. It's interesting, if anything, you know, 14 is kind of obsessive, and 15 is really obsessive. Um, you know, sort of what, what we like about these. Okay. Steve, shall we play 16? So I like with a lot of these pieces how they're connected. So we had 14, we're ferocious, 15, we were, well, I forget, what do we call that? Anxious, and now we're sad. Uh, that, that's what uh, Dolente uh, translates to, is play it sadly. Um, one thing just to comment about this recording, I don't know how fond I am of it. I, maybe the more I, was, I hear it, the more I hate it. The, a, there was a weird cello rondo through the B section, I thought that I don't know if is, is appropriate, but we, I can get past that <laughs> for right now. <laughs> no, I agree. Um, so the, um, one interesting thing, this is in terms of time and length of time it takes to play this p the piece, this is the longest one of the collection. Um, I think it's about a minute 40 or something like that, which is you know, sometime four or five times longer than some of them. Right times of duration. Uh, there are three big sections. There's an A section that lasts for eight measures, uh, a B section that lasts for another, uh, wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 11 measures, and then we have an A prime section that's uh, 15 measures to the end. Um, starting with the A, the A section, it can kind of be broken into a lot of this piece can be broken into two bar phrases or sub phrases, I guess in the so the A section's eight measures, it can kind of be broken into two two halves of four measures because it kind of repeats itself, but each of those four can kind of fit into two bar ideas. Um, and we kind of have three voices going on. There's the pedal E and the bass that actually I think kind of establishes this piece as being an E. Um, and the B section kind of reaffirms that. Um, mo most of the, the melody is chromatic. Uh, and we have the chrom chromatic descending scales in both the um, top two voices. Uh, what's interesting, though, is a lot of the, the they're in thirds most of the time, uh, but then on the main beats on two, one and three where we had in the second voice, where it descends chromatically. Um, this A section is a very close range. It's all about, takes place in about an octave, which is interesting, just with how tightly all three of those voices are um, contained. But I listened to, actually, a recording of Prokofiev play this. Oh, we should have brought that in, maybe next. Time. Yeah, it was just on the internet where I found it. What, and what is interesting is he kind of, this A section is all about the half notes and quarter notes, so kind of longer duration notes. And he kind of treats the eighth notes and especially the two sixteenth notes as ornaments that he just kind of tosses off a little bit. So they're kind of without rhythm, you know, a definite rhythm in the bar. Um, and he does have a slight, um, a cello rondo just in the first measure and a half, in the beginning of the descending chromaticism. So you kind of get the sense you're just kind of falling down until you get to that D sharp um, in the second measure, which is kind of like a five, five chord if you're believing it's an E because you have the D sharp that would like to go to E. So it's kind of, he's kind of suggesting that that's an arrival uh, tone. Right, and then as we transition into the B section, it's kind of connected because we kind of end on an E chord and we begin on an E chord uh, of sorts. 
Now most of the most of the B section kind of each measure starts on a one chord and the rest of it's in some sort of minor five or dominant type chord. Um, so we kind of pivot back and forth between uh, E and uh, E and B uh, throughout the B section. Uh, as far as how the phrases are set up, um, it's kind of a, you can look at it as a 4 plus 4 plus 2, um, or you could even break it up into two bars each. It's kind of difficult because the bass will continue doing its, its pattern for a while while it changes in the top, so it's difficult to come up with a real clear-cut way of dividing where the subphrases begin and end. Um, but one of the ideas in the B section is it's really trying to contrast the A section. Uh, we went from forte to pianissimo, and instead of having it legato with lots of slurs, we have a bunch of eighth notes and eighth thrusts, and we're accenting the offbeats. And this is also, we went from chromaticism, now we have mostly, an ar we have an arpeggiated bass and uh, mostly spelled out chords in this section. And we don't have, actually, and these are all white keys on the keyboard in this section. Uh, there's no accidentals, which is uh, another contrast from the A section. And we're actually starting to expand the, the range of the voice of the instrument. And I, let me see. The only other thing I have to say about the B section is you can, it, you can argue that it's either two or three voices that are happening. I kind of like to think of it as still being three voices. If you take the first note of, you, so you have the top line, which is a voice, and then in the, and what is the bass, if you just take the first note of each of the, each group of four eighth notes, that's kind of a voice in itself. I kind of think of Bach when you have a lot of the bass tone, so it's kind of a pedal with arpeggiated above, where it's trying to create a third voice um, that way. So then we come back to the A prime section, which has everything, it's pretty much just an embellishment of the original A section, um, where we took the A section, it's almost an exact copy. However, we've added an extra bass part, so we have four voices now. And instead of being four plus four, this is five plus five plus five. Um, because between each of the groupings of four from the original A section, we have a transition measure that's been added. Um, and as far as the kind of chord structure goes in this, I kind of look at it as the first group of four measures. I'm calling it a six. We have the C in the bottom, but I'm kind of thinking of it as a six of E. Uh, and that goes into, and then we have a chromat, well, parallel fifths descending into an A, which I'm thinking of as a four uh, of E. As it, then it comes back into E, which is one. So that's kind of how I'm looking at the chord structure loosely of this last part. Um, the real, I think the real highlight of this is we're back to forte and the voice, and we've expanded the range again. We have high voice and then we've dropped down and have a, a low voice, which we didn't have the first time we had A. So we're expanding that way, especially at the end where we get really high um, for the first time in the top voice, uh, we end, and, we, and we end on E, and all the voices. Yeah, yeah, seems good. Anyone else have some comments they'd like to make about it? I have a quick question. Yeah. When you get to the A prime section, is he playing both those treble clocks with one hand, or how is that divided up? Maybe it's a dumb question, but I don't actually know the answer. You know, but I think, I think I would hold the low C's with the sustenuto pedal. I'd hold that with the pedal. I, although I'd experiment, and I might see if I actually just held the regular pedal down if it was too much. Um, but that, that's my sense. It's a good question, right? When you get you know, music that's notated on three staves, you know, exactly what does that mean? It's the real reason it's written like that, maybe just so you can read it. Because if you had both of the soprano parts put on top of each other, it'd get kind of muddy. 
Right. And I think also clearly he's giving you an exact idea of how long he wants the fifth and the bass to be held. So yeah, absolutely, stuff like that's going <clears> on. <throat> now, here's a question for you guys. If the return to A after the little B section, if this was a piece by Brahms, what would we describe that as? Any thoughts? Like the recapitulation. Yes, but what kind of recapitulation? Of variation. Um, yes. Uh, the reason it comes to mind is there's a false recapitulation in Brahms' Fourth Symphony, which is in E minor. And the piece begins, starts beginning again in C major, which it's not supposed to do, and he fixes it. And notice that's what happens here, is that it's like what we know to be E minor is now, oops, E can be the middle note of a C major triad. Uh, and then sort of on we go, we, we then say, oh, well, E can be the top note of an A minor triad, and it's not till the last time, and we use our fifths, those parallel fifths, to get down there, do we finally say, oh, yeah, this is where it's supposed to be. Um, this is a really sort of cool thing from my point of view in terms of that. Other things that, that people notice in terms of this one, yeah. I think I feel the main A section material as being the A minor, or sort of A at least. On a dominant pedal, then. Yeah. Um, especially because in bar three you have that D flat resolving to C natural, while you have F sharp G sharp A in the right hand, sort of a. Right, the F sharp G sharp A, the, the ascending one. Yeah. Resolution. Absolutely. Um, which which is interesting because and then it sounds like it. Um, you know, it's ending on a pretty big half cadence. I mean, really, the last right. Bars. But notice that last half cadence is a little cloudy because the second to the last note you hear is a C natural, right? So that that ambiguity stays, yeah. and I think that's a good good thing to think of in terms of thinking of this as a sort of model for composition in that ambiguity in Prokofiev is not a bad thing, right? In Mozart, ambiguity, while there may be certain things, it's like for the composer's goal working in that style. That's not the big stylistic issue. But here, in fact, absolutely that's the case. Other, other sort of comments or thoughts about this piece? Yeah, Natasha? Um, this probably stood out to just about everyone, but the, uh, I think it was really impressive to me, the way that he um, sort of achieved that dolente sound uh, by with that sort of first three measures uh, theme in the A section, where it's sort of descending in a, what sounds like minor, and then it comes right back up in what sounds like a resolved sort of major. And it just seems to me that if I try and imagine it any other way, either continuing to descend minor or reascending minor, it would give it more anxious feeling. But this like sort of bittersweetness really achieves that sadness. It's a delicate piece. balance yeah. that he achieves here, isn't it? And it's it's just something I, I it really stood out to me. Lucy, how about you? Any 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 thoughts that you're having about the piece? Um, I actually really didn't like that part. Yeah. The the, the, the F sharp T sharp A. I feel like it could have been like it made it sound kind of like a broken toy. Mm -hmm. to me, like, or something like that. Um, like, it just wasn't like, careful enough. But maybe that's like part of the idea that it's like broken. <laughs> You're right. It couldn't, in fact, be. Now, and we have a very ancient history of descending chromatic lines, meaning very sad things in music, right? Uh, one thinks of Bach and Purcell and anybody else, right? This descending chromatic line, just just about as sad as it can get, right? So, absolutely. Um, an, inter an interesting, interesting piece. I, I played this piece when I was like maybe in third grade or fourth <laughs> grade. 
And in the like little piano book, you know, it wasn't all of the you know, I mean, these are not really good pieces generally for third graders. Um, couldn't play them now for that matter. But this one was called Landscape. I don't know who decided it was called Landscape. Uh, I think it's another one of those weird things that when American publishers were stealing Soviet music, they pretty much called it whatever they wanted, but that somehow, you know, little kids would really, you know, relate to this if it was called Landscape. Um, but it, it, it is, it's, it's a remarkable little miniature. Um, perhaps ways in which it's related to the one that precedes it? Well, the note E comes to mind, right? Um, as a pivotal thing. Especially when you look at the ending and E is played with as the fifth, third, and mm -hmm. first scale degree in, in the previous one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, these have been good presentations. Thank you all very much for your work in that regard. And what I think we should do is just briefly regroup. Let's pull some chairs over uh, around the piano or you can stand. And let's look at our sort of imitation utopia pieces. How many people have something they can show? OK, absolutely. Uh, and you know, I hope you all follow the instructions and spend no more than an hour doing this, although I don't believe that from some of you using workhorses. Is there anyone who would prefer to play their own piece? Rich, would you begin? Okay. And which one did you imitate? Well, I, I wrote it before last class, so I kind of imitated number two. Number it's like two? A, it's like a number one, number two hybrid. Okay. All right. That's good. <laughs> Glad to get that on tape. That's really nice. I'm impressed. Leave it there. Leave it there. Now let's see. So how would you describe the form of the piece? Um, it's just kind of like A, B, um, C. Yeah, it's, it's just like A, B, A, B, I guess. OK, so this is A and? This is A, but that's kind of transitional. That's sort of a nice thing. Yeah, gotcha. so, so like this is like kind of like the C section in number two, like shortened into like gotcha. half a bar. <laughs> gotcha. So we've got.
không? Well, it's quite beautiful, and I think it sort of gets into the whole formal world. The sort of slight change here seems very Prokofiev-like. Um, the little bridge section, right? Right, simple, but really, really quite powerful. If I'm going to be nasty about this, I would just say, I don't know why you picked this really boring, stupid chord there. Oh, yeah. Right? Well, it was like less than an hour or so. Uh, exactly. <laughs> but see, I think you've got a real piece of music here. If you will rethink that measure. Uh, I was like, oh, I'll just kind of like shorten the C section. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you would rethink that and give me harmonies as interesting as everything else, mm -hmm. This is a really nice little piece. Okay. okay. So in fact, this is not going to be a throwaway piece for you. You're going to keep this, right? This, this okay. is going to go in, in the to save pile, okay? okay. Excellent. Excellent. Get this the paper. It says, it says jiggity. Jiggity, exactly. <laughs> Something about that piece, jiggity doesn't come to mind. But you know, it's like, exactly, exactly. Nick, you want to play yours? Um, sure, I only wrote like half of it. Okay, well let's hear the half you've got. <laughs> yes, could I only let you have an hour and you're such a perfectionist that probably made you insane. I try not to worry too much about it. Um, also, I have to figure it out. You can improvise the end if you need. The master is still at work. This is like those pictures of like Liszt in his fan club, and we're just sort of sticking. Oh, he wrote a C sharp. Overly flattering. I'm sorry. Lucy needs to sort of get down on the floor though, and you know. <laughs> okay. Give it a go. Give it a go. It's perfect. So, so this is this is um, a, a rip off the first one. Gotcha. And I've basically uh, done the first like A and B section. So okay. I did, yeah. If I wrote this second A, add in some chromatic material. Right. And then it would begin and do a similar process, right? Yeah. It's very beautiful. Very beautiful. Again, no reason that this, this couldn't be one of your pieces. You know, and we may find when we're doing this project that instead of just one, we get you know, two or three or, <laughs> or something like that, which would be nice. It's lovely, Nick. Absolutely. There's this moment here when the E starts to repeat. And I don't think Prokofiev does that, does he? No. That's the nicest part. I think that's really quite beautiful. Um, you know, the, the whole thing is nice, uh, very interesting. Yes, everyone can say, well, it's sort of modeled on the first vision fugitive, but, but there are differences that are quite telling. Um, very nice, absolutely. So if you get in the next few days another hour, finish it. <laughs> well, no, 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 you've already got the material, so it should only take 30 minutes to finish it, OK? Yes. Let's hear another one. Anybody else willing to play theirs? Oh, no. no? Play. Ben, how, are you willing to play or you want me to play? I think it would be better for yeah. really short on time. Okay. That's funny. I'll play this one. Okay. 
Little Miracles of Sight Reading. Neat! Excellent! Obviously the first one again. Yes. <laughs> uh, I may have missed some notes, but, but I think I tried to give you the, the sort of shape of it. Any comments or questions or sort of thoughts about that from other, other folks? Also has a very cryptic ending in Prokofiev vein. I actually hear it because I hear the dominant seventh, even in spite of the Fs in the bass. You know, and the next one's in G. You know, something like that. Um, absolutely. Very good. Very good. There's a sense already today that everybody is feeling like so relieved that they're not having to worry about parallel octaves <laughs> or the regular resolution of the diminished seventh chord that there's just sort of this torrent of good ideas being unleashed. Fine, fine. I'd like to see the rest of this. How are we going to make sense of sort of that wacky shift up for the cadence, which very interestingly handled. Absolutely. I think this is going well. And again, uh, you know, it, it, it isn't exactly like the original, but very rich, very rich. Good, good. Again, something to keep. Simone? See, even with the name not on a paper in front of me. <laughs>
nice. Very nice. Again, all of the sort of things are in place, the chromatic and scale. But, but, this, but I think the sound's very different. The, even the B section. has a very different feel to it. Um, absolutely. Really nice. Really nice. Lucy, how about yours? if these are rolled? Okay, just for me, I mean, people with real hands could play them, but I would need to roll them. Yeah, again, I, I, very nice, very nice. You know, we can look a little more in depth, but I just want to make sure we play through all of them today. It's good stuff. Uh, Steve? sort of a, a cryptic ending to it. Absolutely, absolutely. All of these are things to be kept. I'm not seeing anything that anyone needs to throw away. Should we look, <coughs> Reggie? Yeah, I looked at it again. It looks like it might be like, impossible to play. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a you, shot. You can like omit like the bottom. I'll yeah. see what I can do. I'll, I'll come up with something. I didn't do it perfectly, but I did okay. 
Absolutely, good. Natasha, anything? Uh, no. Fine, fine. Did we play everybody's? Okay, these are a nice start. I'm, I'm glad to see some you know, people taking the assignment um, not only seriously, but sort of uh, getting into the spirit of it. I, th I think you'll find uh, there's a sort of sense of release in working in this style as opposed to what some of you have been doing for four years. Um, so absolutely, um, go with it. Um, and in fact, I might encourage people to be more bold rather than less bold. Okay? Thank you all so much. Nice work. And um, thank you. <laughs>